Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church, Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. Good morning, all. Thank you very much for being here. I want to go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, no doubt more people will be coming in. Uh, however, the earlier I introduce him, the more time we have for him. Uh, Michael Lapsley is a deep friend of All Saints Church, of many of us who are here. Um, he's received us in South Africa. We've been happy to reciprocate and receive him here. He was born in New Zealand, joined the Society of the Sacred Mission, and was sent to South Africa in 1973. There he became active in the anti-apartheid movement, ultimately joining the African National Congress. And I hope that Michael may tell a little story about how Archbishop Desmond Tutu did not want any of his clergy to be joining the African National Congress. And Michael disobeyed Desmond Tutu, which tells you something about Michael's courage um, and um, opinionated trajectory in life. So graciously said. He joined the African National Congress. He was exiled to Lesotho and, and then Zimbabwe, where he narrowly survived an assassination attempt. He returned to South Africa to found the Institute for Healing of Memories. And he'll tell you about the incidents that led to that. Um, I have never been around uh, Michael um, when I didn't grow, uh, be challenged and inspired and transformed. And it is with great pleasure and delight and gratitude to God that I introduce him again to this well and ask you to warmly welcome him, our brother, Michael Lapsley. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ed. One of the... Uh, Delightful things about traveling the world is not that you have permanent jet lag, which I do, uh, <laughs> but rather that you have homes, places that you belong, places where there is family, where you have mothers, brothers, sisters, grandparents, aunts, cousins, and for me, all saints is... It's one of those places. Um, I think, in fact, uh, it was probably 1991 that I was the first time I was here uh, at All Saints and have come back um, again and again. And while I hope that God has used me to say something, I know that I've always gained by the warmth of community that I have experienced. And I was struck in the liturgy that we've just uh, celebrated, and some of you will celebrate at 11, by the commitment of this church to be a place of transformation, uh, God's redeeming work. Um, and that's the title of my book, Redeeming the Past, My Journey from Freedom Fighter to Healer. And it's really the story of of a child who tried to follow Jesus. And what that's meant uh, for me. Um, and I hope that when you read it, it will resonate with you, not because you're all people with no hands, because you've also sought to follow with all your humanness, with all your messed upness, with all your contradictions, with all your ambiguity. Um, and that's what it's about. And I hope that while the book describes in graphic details horrible things like being bombed, it is a story of hope. And I th hope again that that will resonate with the journey of the people of faith in this place. Now, we made a little DVD that we, to go with the book. 
Um, so we're now going to show you the DVD, and then I'll make a few more comments. And, and the DVD is like the book, actually. It's my story and the story of healing of memories across the world. Um, so it is a, a reflection of that. So if we could ask the magicians to push some buttons, and we'll watch the DVD. Alan Michael Lapsley was born in New Zealand on June 2nd, 1949. I was born and brought up in New Zealand, this very small country. My parents, uh, in terms of a developed country, were quite poor. So I remember hard work, lack of money, but not poverty in the sense of ever having gone to bed hungry. Both my parents were loving, committed Christians, so I was brought up very much in a uh, church environment and was, since I was a child, was quite a religious child uh, and interested in issues of faith. His interest in issues of faith grew into a calling, and at the age of 17, he traveled to Australia to become a priest in the Anglican Church. At the end of high school, I went to begin my training to be a priest. In some ways, when I look back, it's quite amazing that they actually permitted me at the age of 17 to leave the country, to go to another country, and to train to be, uh, to be a priest. Michael Lapsley joined the Anglican religious community in Australia in 1967. In 1971, he took his vows in the Society of the Sacred Mission. Lapsley was ordained as a priest in 1973. In that same year, the community chose to transfer him to South Africa to enroll in undergraduate studies in the city of Durban. It was in South Africa that Father Michael's life would be changed forever. Nothing prepared me for South Africa. I had read and read and read, and yet I had understood nothing as I look back. And I suppose I thought that when I arrived in South Africa, I'd find three groups of people, the oppressed, the oppressor, and if you like, the human race that I would belong to. And uh, I often say that when I arrived in South Africa, I stopped being a human being and I became a white man. Because from the moment of my arrival, every single aspect of my life was decided by the color of my skin. Fate landed Father Michael in South Africa during the height of the apartheid repression and escalating violence. Far from being an ordinary student, his appointment as chaplain to both white students and black students on two campuses gave him a unique perspective. I wasn't simply living in this white cocoon of white privilege, but I was seeing day by day and relating to people who were um, at the receiving end of uh, racial oppression. Uh, and feeling its wrongness and its injustice. For Father Michael, this would be a test of faith. What does a man of God do in the face of injustice? From earliest childhood, had an understanding of Christianity that meant that all human beings were made in God's image and likeness. All human beings had value simply because we're human. My experience from the day I arrived in South Africa was this was the very opposite of Christianity. Because here was a society in which all value derived from the color of your skin, 
not from the commonness of your humanity. While theological questions of right and wrong, good and evil, swirled in his mind, Father Michael was faced with a very practical question of which side was he on, the oppressed or the oppressor? In a way, I suppose, from the beginning, I guess I had, in a crude sense, two choices, beat them or join them. And I guess in my heart of hearts, I decided to beat them. Ever increasingly, my life became committed to ending that system. Over the next three years, Father Michael spoke out against the injustices of apartheid and became active in the anti-apartheid movement. It all came to a head in 1976 when school children began to protest having to learn their lessons in Afrikaans and the fact that the education they were receiving was inferior. During a, that period of more than a year, more than a thousand school children were shot on the streets of South Africa. And then vast numbers were detained, imprisoned, tortured. Shortly after that, I was then expelled from South Africa. I had begun to speak out against the killing of children, but also against the torture and the detention of students and young people. Uh, but when I was expelled, there was no formal reason given. Uh, and so then, in agreement with my community, I went to live in Lesotho, where my community had also been working for a long time. After being expelled in September of 1976, Father Michael moved to Lesotho, where he continued his studies and joined the African National Congress. He became chaplain to the ANC in exile. Philosophically, ideologically, theologically, I was immensely attracted immediately to the ANC. The, 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 the stumbling block was, a, was that I was a committed pacifist, and the ANC, after 50 years of nonviolent struggle, had actually opted for arms. But the killing of uh, school children pushed me over the edge, and I began to say, in this context, as a last resort, when all other options, all other avenues are, uh, are closed, uh, people do have a right to defend themselves. And so if you like, the last hurdle had been crossed that made it possible for me um, to join uh, the African National Congress of South Africa. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. In 1982, 100 South African commandos raided the city of Maseru, Lesotho, in search of ANC members who were believed to be in hiding. 42 people were killed, including five women and two children. After the attack, Father Michael moved to Zimbabwe. As years passed, we became the hunted. By the time I left Lesotho, uh, you never drove a car without looking underneath it to see whether a bomb had been uh, placed there. It was in Zimbabwe in 1990, three months after ANC leader Nelson Mandela's release from prison, that Father Michael was sent a letter bomb by the apartheid regime. It was hidden inside of two religious magazines. He lost both hands and sight in one eye in the blast and was seriously burned. We know that it was part of the machinery of the apartheid state. It wasn't a, you know, an individual act, but it was part of the machineries of death of the apartheid state that endured beyond 1990. The act of opening the magazine was the detonating device for a bomb. I can still remember what happened, uh, the actual explosion, it's still, it's still something with me. Um, I remember pain of a scale that I didn't think a human being could ever um, experience. I remember going into darkness. Being, being thrown backwards by the force of the bomb. Um, the exact angle saved my life that I opened it. I opened it on, this, on a small coffee table. If I'd opened it in a, something like this, 
a table like this, it would have killed me because it would have knocked out the, the heart or knocked off the head. But I've always been clear that the person I hold responsible ultimately for my bombing is F.W. de Klerk. I spoke, said that I'm not filled with hatred or bitterness or self-pity, nor that I want revenge. I think, I think what I believe in is not retribution. I believe in restorative justice. If, if F.W. was to come to me, or the person who made the bomb was to come to me and said, I'm sorry for what I did, and I want your forgiveness, and this is what I am now doing in the way of reparation, not to me personally, but to our country and our people. These are the kinds of things I'm doing to heal our land. Then, of course, one would say, of course, yes, forgiveness. There would not be a problem about that. Father Michael returned to South Africa in 1992. He became the chaplain of the Trauma Center for Victims of Violence and Torture in Cape Town. The center assisted South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was there that he became aware of the tremendous healing power of telling your story. All South Africans had been damaged by their experience of the apartheid years, no matter what side they were on. Also that all of us had a story to tell. All of us carried stuff inside of us as a consequence um, of the journey the nation had traveled. This work led to the founding of the Institute for the Healing of Memory in 1998. This workshop is a journey. It's a journey that is going to focus not so much on what we think, but on what we feel. He started giving workshops that enable South Africans of all races to tell their stories of pain and trauma. Your heroic determination. Your commitment to justice. Viva! It helped me to open up. I think it's there that I managed to say things that I never even told my mother. I was able to express myself my story, my feelings. And for the first time, somebody was listening. I cried for all the pain of the apartheid that affected my life. I cried because of all the anger. I could put my arm on the shoulder of people that I've never been so close to before. And that, uh, for me as a white person, it meant a tremendous lot to me. Father Michael soon realized that telling these stories in a safe, supportive environment helped to start the process of healing. He believes that the entire human family is burdened with trauma of one kind or another because of what we've done, what was done to us, and what we have failed to do. Therefore, everyone young and old, rich and poor, could benefit by telling their story. Father Michael now travels throughout Africa, Europe, North America, and the South Pacific, giving healing of memory workshops to help heal the world one story at a time. At some point in everybody's life, there's some kind of trauma from which they need to heal. But where people have been particularly oppressed, where people have gone through situations of war or oppression, uh, then there is an even greater need for healing to take place. And so human beings everywhere need to find the way of detoxifying, if you like, vomiting out the poison of the things that have happened to them so that they may indeed uh, integrate into their lives what has happened but also lead uh, free, fulfilling and whole lives.
Thank you. Last year, um, I spoke in this forum. Um, it was supposed to be a double act with Serene Jones, who wrote uh, a book about trauma and grace, and um, she didn't come, so the double act became a, a single act. Um, and I spoke here about healing of memories. And I said, isn't it a time that at All Saints Church we offered a healing of memories workshop? Um, and that happened here Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I came here with my colleague, uh, where is he? My daughter, Kwadi. If you'd like just to stand up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and we are both part of the Institute for Healing of Memories in Cape Town. Um, and maybe one of the things I learned from Martin Luther King, you have a dream, but then you have to go on dreaming and having more and more dreams. So we had the workshop, but of course it never stops there. The next dream is to capacitate uh, people in this parish, in this faith community, so that healing of memories could become a further strand of the beautiful work that is done uh, in this place. I'm hoping to come back. Of course, it's really just an excuse because I love coming to All Saints. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, uh, but I think it would be wonderful um, if, if this could become an ongoing part of the work here. Maybe just to say that here in the United States, uh, we work in New York. We are a 501c3 in the US. Um, and we work with uh, women who have been abused who are also disabled in a facility in New York. Um, and we, we also have had very close relationship with September 11th families for Peaceful Tomorrows, those people who lost relatives on September the 11th who said, you may not go to war in the name of our loved ones. And so we've worked with them We're at our open workshops. We've had people from the Greensboro um, uh, massacre, um, also, in, in, in Minnesota, we work with um, homeless war veterans. And we know that a disproportionate number of homeless people in the United States of America um, are war veterans. And I might just say that I've come to the conclusion that the soul of the United States of America is infected by endless war. And there is a, a desperate need for voices who can say, we're not unpatriotic, precisely because we love the United States. That's why we're against militarism. That's why we're against unending war. We know that, is it, how many, 14, is it every single day, um, war veterans commit suicide? Uh, in the US. Um, and you remember there was a major last year who went berserk and killed many people. Um, and I remember an article in the New York Times uh, and it had one line that jumped out of the page. It said, the war comes home with those who fight it. The war comes home with those who fight it. So the war isn't simply in Afghanistan or Iraq. It's in the bedrooms of the nation. And that is a, a huge issue uh, for national healing. But also all over the world where I go, there's a fundamental issue of acknowledgement of past history that still comes back to bite us. So the obvious ones in the United States, the big ones, uh, what happened to First Nations, to Native Americans, what happened to slavery. And some of us believe the United States of America won't truly heal until that's fully acknowledged and faced. But don't think this is unique to the United States. I could list country after country after country where there are issues of acknowledgement. Um, there are still the so-called comfort women of Korea who still protest outside Japanese embassies and say, you need to acknowledge 
what is done to us. So the, the organization that my daughter and I belong to is a little tiny, minute organization, the Institute for Healing of Memories. But healing of memories itself is something whose time has come in the human family. We are a generation that's haunted by the unfinished business from the past, and we need to um, address it. I had a, a biography that was written um, 16 years ago, published 16 years ago. That means I must have been about 10 when it was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> many of the uh, reviewers um, of it um, said, okay, okay, yes, but one day we want to hear his version, his voice. Um, now, I've been continuing this work of healing of memories, and over the years people have kept saying to me, when are you going to write your story about your own journey and also the journey of healing of memories? And then a colleague, um, he's, uh, he lives in Portland, he was uh, born in Jerusalem, Armenian-American, a man called Stephen Karakassian. He came to me and said, um, you need to write. But he not only said you need, to, you need the story, to, but he said, I will write it. I'll do the writing, but it'll be your voice. So for, uh, we, we went to a place, some of you know Mary Knoll in New York, um, and we spent two months there recording interviews every single day. Um, and then last year we won a, a residency in Italy where we uh, completed uh, the manuscript. And one of the things that I realized that if it was going to be of value to people to read, I had to self-disclose. And so I have. I've said things in the book that I'd never ever said. Uh, to, they were in my heart, but I'd never said uh, to another human being. Uh, when you read the book, you'll discover that um, I'm not a plaster saint. I'm a person of flesh and blood. Uh, and I hope precisely as I share my own fragility, frailty, ambiguity, contradiction, and, and doubt, that it will uh, encourage and inspire you uh, in your own uh, journeys of faith. Um, I think we have a few minutes. Thank you very much. And by the way, you can't buy more than 10 books each. <laughs> and incidentally, the book is only, while we're getting the mics ready, the book is only coming out in July, but it ha they brought it the forward to be um, at the Catholic Booksellers Convention um, in Chicago. And so there was a launch in uh, Chicago on Tuesday, and this is the second launch, even though the book has not yet been published. But All Saints is so special, we thought you should have the advanced copies. <laughs> comments uh, about this relative to the uh, conflict between Arab and Jew. Um, you know, it, it sometimes seems to me like the European Jew suffered for something like 1900 years at the hands of his Christian brothers uh, and then finally went off to inflict the vengeance that he should have taken upon the Europeans onto the Arabs, creating yet another population in need of healing that is not being healed. And also, kind of in view of the fact that the suffering of the Jew, particularly uh, through the German genocide, has been commemorated and memorialized almost to the point of becoming a fetish, yet the wound is not healed, and the Arabs are continually being asked to pay for it. Yes, no, thank you very much. Um, there's a US uh, magazine, um, uh, uh, pro-Israel magazine, um, and they wrote to the publicist that Orbis, the publisher, set up for my book, uh, because they'd been sent to, uh, asked to review my book, and they said, um, what's, what's Father Lapsley's position on Israel? 
Uh, well, Father Lepsi responded by saying, I've never been to Israel. Um, but I did go on to say that it, uh, I see it as a place of uh, great pain and a place in great need of, of healing. Um, but let, let me just um, add um, a couple of comments. One, one of South Africa's greatest leaders, Chief Albert Lutuli, once said, those who think of themselves as victims eventually become the victimizers of others. And people who do, people who have had the most terrible things done to them then give themselves permission to do terrible things to others. And in places of great conflict, there's often competition for victimhood. When both sides to a conflict say, um, but um, we are the real victims, you're not really victims. Um, if terrible things happen to human beings, there's one of two journeys they're likely to travel. One is the journey of victims who become victimizers, who become victims, who become victimizers. And this is true of individuals, it's true of communities, it's true of nations. Um, the victim of September the 11th didn't waste time to become the victimizer. Um, but the healing journey and the Christ journey is the journey of the victim who becomes the survivor, who becomes the victor. Um, and, and healing of memories seeks to break that chain that turns victims into victimizers. Let's say that tomorrow Israel-Palestine had a just political solution. Then it will be the time for healing of memories. Because there's a lot of evidence that when horrible conflicts end in terms of armed conflict, the conflict doesn't end in the bedroom. And you have escalating um, domestic, sexual, family violence. So it's not happening in weapons outside, it's now happening inside. And we see that with the, uh, here, the war veterans who, who either go into harm of others in the family or into self-harm. Um, I think we as South Africans have a deep sense of identification um, with the Palestinian people. Thank you. Seeing the um, women and children uh, brutalized in South Africa made me think of what's happening in Syria. I appreciate your position that we need to get out of war in the United States. It's rotting our soul. What is your recommendation for the world's response to what's happening in Syria? Um, what's the answer, Ed, to that question? I think it's, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, thank God, I'm not the Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, but I think the Syrians have become, in some ways, the victims of the real politic of Libya. Um, and I think the world went into Libya, not the world, uh, the NATO, etc. Um, and I think the in the end, is as horrendous as what was done to the Libyan people, it was about oil, uh, fundamentally. Uh, and I think the world has said, oh my goodness, but we can't go through, we can't be duped again in the name of human rights. But I, I think there is a total horror of what is, of what is happening in Syria. And I think the, the, the world needs to, uh, to act and to act as decis decisively as it possibly can. Um, but 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 also, uh, and what you speak to is the children that the wounds go on for generations. The conflict can happen in a very short time, but the wounds cross generations, uh, and people carry in their very souls the memory um, of what was done to them. Michael, let me ask you a question. Can you go back to the issue around nonviolence and pacifism, and what happened inside you and your um, sole decisions to join the ANC, and where does that 
commitment and that complex of values around nonviolence live in you now? Mm, thank you. That's a nice, simple question for a Sunday, <laughs> Sunday morning before lunch. Thank you, Father. Do you have it? Any, any other questions? You know, as a, a religious adolescent uh, and a pacifist adolescent, uh, I believe, believed that my father had been wrong to fight in the war uh, against Hitler, which, which, which he had. Um, and uh, when I lived in South Africa, first time, uh, I preached pacifism. So I would say to young black students, if you're Christian, you will not use the force of arms to achieve your rights. And the government thought I was a very nice person. But I was a little bit consistent. So I would say to white students, if you're Christian, you will not use the force of arms to prevent your fellow citizens for achieving your rights. That conversation was illegal. I was liable for prison sentence for having said to people, you should consider um, not going to to war. But taking back just one step, during the Vietnam War, uh, you know, Australia and New Zealand often lined up to fight unjust wars with the United States. Uh, and when I was in the monastery as a young novice, uh, the head of my order uh, was a leader in the campaign for peace in Vietnam. And wearing these habits, we marched in the streets of Australia for peace. And people started cancelling their donations to the monastery. Um, religious people advocating peace, how dare they? <laughs> advocating war will give them money. Um, but as I said, you saw that there, it was in the, the killing of kids that my pacifism fell apart. But I, I, I never found pacifism easy nor did I find, uh, I mean, I came to the conclusion based on our history. And remember, in South Africa, people have spent 50 years struggling non-violently. And remember, in South Africa, people were voteless. They didn't have a non-violent legal way of ending that system. So I came to the very painful conclusion that we had, that, that armed struggle had become morally legitimate, necessary, and justified but we continue to pay a moral cost for what I think we had no alternative. Uh, there's an interview with uh, Oliver Tambo, who was President General of the ANC uh, before Mandela, and uh, he's asked about the armed struggle, and his voice reduces to a whisper, and he says, they forced us into it. If you read our history, the reluctance of the majority um, to uh, opt for arms across generations. You know, in the West, we spend about 10 minutes before we, we rush for, for the guns. Um, but, I, but I suppose, as the title of the book, My Journey from Freedom Fighter to Healer, uh, I understand um, why people eventually opt for arms uh, in some contexts. But I think uh, it always should be the last resort. Um, and my own work, uh, my own life is dedicated to the journey uh, of healing. Thank you. So, one last question. Um, <laughs> so, now, now the big one. Yeah. So, Michael, when you've preached here and talked here before, You've said something that has reverberated in my own thinking, my own teaching, my own preaching. And it has to do with what are the essentials for one to be on the healing journey, to move from victor to survivor, to vic from victim to survivor to victor. And if you could just kind of lay those out as a, mm. as a parting, as a farewell for us, I would appreciate that. Sure. Now, I can give you that answer in two minutes, but the journey can be the journey of a lifetime. 
You know? So I can say, victim, survivor, victor, but for many people it takes decades. I think sometimes when terrible things happen in our lives, uh, if you think of life being like a river, the river flows, something terrible happens and our life becomes like a whirlpool and people live life in terms of that incident in their life. They, they, I mean, they, they, they're physically alive, they have a life, but, but in their souls, they're stuck in a moment of history. And what I've learned across the world that um, often the key first step on the journey of healing lies in acknowledgement. I want to make the distinction between knowledge and acknowledgement. So in a family, maybe there's abuse happening, everybody knows about it. So there's knowledge, but there's no acknowledgement. And so often when, and people, in our workshops, people will say, this happened to me 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And I'll say, well, have you often talked about it? No, this is the first time. This is the first time I felt safe enough um, that I, um, as, as a friend uh, of ours said in New York, I felt able to be vulnerable without being judged. Able to be vulnerable without being judged. And, and, and that can be that key shifting where the whirlpool stops and people begin to take back agency. If, some, if something's been done to me, I'm a uh, victim. If I physically survive, I'm a survivor. But the next step uh, is when you take back agency, you take back the ability to help shape and create the world. But let me just add one tiny point that I learned from the Sami, who are the reindeer people in the northern part of Norway and Sweden, Finland. They said to me, our church has acknowledged how it played a part in our oppression. And they've said they're sorry. But they said, for the mainstream of the society, there's no knowledge of what is being acknowledged. And I often feel, and I, I taught young African-American students in New York several years ago, that white America has no knowledge of the pain which is black America. Um, so knowledge and acknowledgement are of key importance uh, in, the, in, the, in, in what is often the long journey of healing for individuals, for communities, for nations. Thank you very much.